Please welcome Mr. Carlos Gutierrez, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, accompanied by Dean Elwood, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm Dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I welcome you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I think we should have a wonderful evening tonight, um, a most enlightening one. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, though, I would like to just acknowledge a couple of special guests that are here. First of all, I want to welcome the members of the Cuban American Undergraduate Student Association. Thank you for, for being here and being a part of this. Members of the Latino Political Coalition, my thanks to you as well, as well as students representing the Institute of Politics and the Center for Public Leadership and the CPL fellows and Dario Collado uh, for the program, uh, the program manager for CPL's Latino Leadership Initiative. So it's wonderful to have you all here uh, this evening. Now let me take a moment to uh, introduce our very special guest. Um, his, uh, his appearance here could not be more timely and for a number of reasons. Obviously, commerce seems like it's very much in jeopardy these days. But that's not the primary reason for and the focus of our speaker tonight. His focus and his background starts in Cuba. Uh, and it is also a, a moment in Cuban history where uh, it appears to be a turning point. Obviously, the transfer of leadership uh, to Raul Castro from his brother Fidel uh, is a moment when people can take stock and where the future can be laid. Um, the, one of the most interesting features about our, our speaker tonight, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Carlos Gutierrez, is his very personal story. Now, President Bush, when he nominated the secretary, he stated he understands the world of business from the very first rung on the ladder to the very top and knows exactly what it takes to help American businesses grow and create jobs. But understand how far on that first ladder he started and where it went. He was born in Havana, Cuba in 1953, and he came to the United States with his family in 1960. He learned English from a bellhop in a Miami hotel. Is that really true? That's an amazing thing. Um, you'll discover it, it, it took. Um, and then in 1975, uh, after a, very, a variety of uh, other activities, he joined Kellogg, uh, not the business school, the cereal company. Uh, and uh, was a sales representative uh, in Mexico. And um, he then left Cuba, um, uh, and as he said in a New York Times article, he left Cuba to come to this great country in 1960 as a political refugee and started selling cereal out of a van in Mexico City. I should have mentioned he was a sales rep in Mexico. But he, he started there and literally rose to become uh, the chief executive officer in 1999, the youngest CEO in the company's nearly 100-year-old history. Quite a step from being, learning English from a bellhop. And in April 2000, he was named chairman of the board for the Kellogg Company, where he successfully guided the company through a very challenging financial period and increased profits dramatically. And then in uh, 2004, he became the Secretary of Commerce. Now, one of the things that I talk about frequently uh, as one of the great challenges uh, for this school is the fact that all of the interesting public problems cross the boundaries between business, government, and civil society. In Secretary Gutierrez, we have someone whose department crosses those boundaries and whose own personal life does. The department oversees everything from launching weather satellites and protecting coral reefs at, uh, at NOAA um, to issuing patents, the Patent and Trademark Office is there, conducting the census, those of us who are scholars really love the census, um, promoting trade and economic development, uh, and communication security and the like. And if you think about just one small element of that, the census, this requires once every 10 years gearing up to do a massive survey that includes adding something like 850,000 additional employees and managing that whole process. One, by the way, that will determine how many members of Congress are from each district. So it's highly political, highly charged, and the like. 
He travels internationally to work with foreign governments and businesses. Um, he's his, in part to enhance uh, trade and promote U.S. exports. He's played a key, a key role in the passage of CAFTA DR, trademark, uh, a land, I'm sorry, a landmark agreement that removes trade barriers and expands export opportunities in Latin America. He's spoken about the importance of working for economic growth and trade as a means of achieving growth as a sound foundation for development, providing jobs and opportunities to citizens throughout. In any case, our, this secretary has been truly a man for many continents, a man for many seasons, and tonight we're very, very fortunate to hear him speak to us tonight on issues uh, involving um, Cuba and other kinds of things. He indeed oversees the compact with the people of Cuba and chairs the commission for the assistance of a free Cuba. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Carlos Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, what a pleasure to be here uh, in this great institution. Dean Elwood, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a unique privilege for me to be able to talk about Cuba and to get into the subject of Cuba. Uh, you'll find out very quickly that I have a, a very clear point of view about Cuba, uh, but that, of course, isn't to say that I can't learn about Cuba, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I'm looking forward to, to having a good discussion about our thoughts about this, this tremendous experience that has taken place 90 miles from our shores. We were just saying a little while ago that while Cuba hasn't been at the front of foreign policy for many decades, it will soon be. During many of your generations it will be because of events, because of changes, because uh, there's, there's clearly a changing of the guard coming in Cuba, and that will uh, impact events in Cuba. And events in Cuba, 90 miles from our country, it will impact us, and we will have a role to play, I hope. Uh, so uh, let me get started, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you, but I thought I would set the stage and, and maybe provoke some, some uh, discussions and some questions. Interestingly, 1959, uh, April of 1959, Fidel Castro came to Harvard. This was four months after he had uh, toppled the uh, Batista government, uh, Batista, the ba Batista dictatorship, and he came to the U.S. in a kind of a friendship, goodwill mission. And uh, I, I brought a quote from that, uh, sort of a, a quote that has made the rounds, and I thought I would just start with uh, this specific quote from his speech here and also from his speech at Washington. So it was clearly something that he, he had in his talking points that he wanted to get through. Uh, April 1959 says, there is not communism or Marxism in our ideas, only representative democracy and social justice. This was very much his message at that time and what he was getting across uh, when he came to the U.S. Later on, as as books have been published and as more has been written about Cuba and Castro's life, uh, a, an interesting quote of Castro of June 1958 uh, was published not long ago. It was actually a letter that he wrote uh, to a very close friend of his who was part of, the, uh, part of his movement, uh, June 1958, and it says, and I'll put these quotes together because I think they, uh, they they shed a lot of light on Castro and Cuba. Uh, 1958, the quote says, when this war is over, this war being the war to topple Batista, I will begin a much longer and a much larger war for me. The war that I will wage is against the U.S. I realize that that is my true destiny. So, interesting, the, the, the juxtaposition of those two statements. Uh, in 1961, in June of 61, about two years after he came to the U.S., after he was here at Harvard, 
uh, he made this quote, which I will, uh, I'll use and then, and then get on with some of the points. 1961, speaking in Havana in, the, you know, in front of hundreds of thousands of people, it says, uh, I am a Marxist-Leninist, and I will be for the rest of my life. So we have these three quotes. One is, I stand for democracy. Two is, six months before, my real purpose in life is to wage war against the US. And then three, um, I will be a Marxist-Leninist for the rest of my life. Those three quotes, I believe, if you're trying to figure out Cuba, if you're trying to figure out the last 50 years, if you're trying to think about how does this individual think, uh, you will find that most actions that have come out of Cuba in the last 50 years, somehow you can trace back to one of these quotes, uh, especially the one about the US and of course, especially the one about communism. What I will tell you and what I will uh, convey to you today in my discussion is that uh, I believe that, that Fidel Castro is first and foremost um, anti-American and that communism has been almost a tactic to enable him to achieve that policy goal. He sees himself as the anti-American. He's here to be the person who hopefully topples the US. Communism, a tactic. You'll hear a lot of theories about this. That's, that's my theory. And, um, and as you can imagine, I believe that now that 50 years have come by and we can look back on the past and look back at history, uh, I am going to uh, do my best to convince you that the last 50 years have been one of the great social disasters of our time um, and one of the most tragic events, social, political events that have taken place over the last 100 years and that ultimately it has been a success because it has kept Castro in power but it has been a tremendous failure if your goal is to increase freedom, improve prosperity, give people hope, allow individuals to develop their God-given gifts. So let me get on with it and I'll find out in the Q&A if I, if I was uh, at all successful in trying to move you toward uh, my corner. Uh, January 2009, as you know, the 50th anniversary of that day, he took over uh, January 1, 1959, so this will be 50 years, 50 years, if you think about that. It's 50 years, not just the same political party in office, but it's 50 years that the same, you know, five or six individuals, Fidel Castro, who is now 82, Raul Castro, his brother, who is 77, um, uh, Vice President Machado Ventura, who is 77, so this is the same group of people, the same individuals that have been running uh, the country uh, for the last 50 years. And it, it's ironic because this is a time around the world where more, more countries than ever before have actually um, embraced the idea of elections and democracy and representative democracy and having people have a say in government. Uh, and uh, peaceful transitions of government. In, in fact, in, in Latin America, I would say that I can't remember a time in our hemisphere when there have been more elected governments than now. We may not agree with all of them, and we may quarrel versus whether they're all truly representative, uh, but they have gone through a process. Uh, they have gone through elections, more so than ever before, uh, the only exception, of course, is Cuba, which has uh, embraced very much a Marxist-Leninist discipline uh, since, you know, 1961, 1962. Let me talk to you about the economy and talk to you a little bit anecdotally about the economy because it's very difficult to get numbers on GDP, on inflation, on unemployment, um, and, and you'll find that, you know, they have their own method of calculating things. So, 
Uh, I'll do so in a, a brief anecdotal description. Uh, the, the average Cuban makes about $20 per month. This is exchange rates and at, our, uh, at our currency. And, and part of the big problem of Cuba is that the government, of course, provides uh, rations uh, for food and medicine and what have you. The food rations last about 10 days. And, and then uh, Cubans are left to solve their problem, as they call it in Cuba, resolve their problem over the next 20 days. And what that has created is an amazing culture of petty corruption. They say that Cuba is the only country in the world where one kilo has less than, um, or, or, or one pound has less than 16 ounces. Because if you buy something at the store, the employee there uh, will take an ounce for himself because he's got to take it home to fill the gap of those 20 days that the government is providing. And it just has this incredible multiplying effect throughout the economy. Uh, the irony here, of course, is that uh, by and large, business is illegal. Think about that. Business, free enterprise, is illegal in Cuba unless it's done by the state. So if, if to uh, compensate for that shortfall of 20 days, you decide, as many people do, that you're going to open up a little cafeteria in your kitchen or that you're going to find supplies and sell them in the black market, uh, you can land in jail. You can be in a lot of trouble. Um, you are committing a crime. And any time that, uh, that, that someone wants to use that against you, you can find yourself sitting in a jail cell for having sold something on the black market or having started a little business. So an incredibly complex set of circumstances uh, that have been created by this, this conviction that the only way forward is this Marxist-Leninist dogma. And um, because of that, there's very little innovation, there's very little creation, uh, there's very little um, of, of what we call the entrepreneurial spirit and things have essentially stood still. Uh, if you are a, an automobile collector, Cuba is your place. Because you still find, you know, 1959, I mean, essentially the country has uh, stood still from an economic standpoint. Uh, I want to talk about the hurricane because that's very topical, it's very recent. Cuba has just been hit very hard by two hur uh, hurricanes. And uh, from what we know and what we have gathered, this is real, real tough. This is, this is the real thing. This has been throughout the island. Uh, places like Pinal del Rio have been absolutely devastated. Uh, our estimate, or what we read in, in public sources, is that about 400,000 uh, houses have been damaged to the point that they're not uh, useful anymore. Uh, agriculture has been damaged. It, it's, a, it's a country that was in trouble before and now has been hit very, very seriously. This weekend, last, uh, actually Friday evening, we, the U.S. government, made our fourth offer of humanitarian aid to Cuba. The first two offers were made the way we typically do worldwide, which is let us send down an assessment team. They'll assess the problem. They'll take a look at the damage. They'll come back, put together a package, and we'll offer humanitarian aid on the basis of that package. They said, we don't need an assessment team. We don't need anybody to come here, especially from the U.S., and assess our situation. So the third offer we made was bypassing the assessment team. We said, we'll put together a plane, $5 million. We'll send it to you wherever you want, no conditions. That offer was rejected. And they said, we want to buy on credit. We want you to lift the embargo. We're not trying to sell you anything. We want to give you give you aid. We made the fourth offer uh, for building materials to repair homes, plus food, medicine, uh, tents, all the things that we know they need, and we are waiting for an answer. Uh, but I find that, personally, I find that the extreme 
of politics. And here's where the, uh, here's where the rhetoric comes in. I, I heard uh, Castro actually wrote us back a note in, his, in the uh, newspaper. He said, you know, the dignity of the Cuban people cannot be bought. It's a heck of a statement. And I would say that there's a difference between the dignity of the leaders being Fidel and his group versus the well-being and the hunger of the people. And I think they're confusing things. So I think the people in military are walking around saying, we have great dignity because we did not accept aid from the US. But I don't think the people who are starving and, and, and thirsty and don't have where to sleep and don't have enough to eat and they don't know what to do with the kids, I don't think they confuse dignity with hunger. So uh, that's part of the frustration we're going through with Cuba. Um, there are reforms that have been made, so-called reforms, since Castro took over. As you know, Fidel uh, has been ill since uh, June, July of 2006. Last year, uh, Raul was named the formerly uh, the president of Cuba, so he's taken over uh, Cuba, and he announced some reforms. And let me just give you an idea of what these reforms are, because they've, they've had a lot of play around the, the world. Uh, Cubans are now permitted to buy cell phones. Um, they're now permitted to rent automobiles. And they're now permitted to stay in hotels that have been destined for tourists. Um, but only if they have Cuban convertible pesos, which unfortunately are unavailable for Cubans. Uh, two, the sale of DVD players and computers has been authorized. Uh, based on improved availability of electricity. Uh, video content is totally, totally censored, and access to the internet is limited to a very select group of people. What they have is an intranet, but the internet essentially is illegal. Uh, and then finally, essential electronics, such as ovens and toasters, will be made available for sale, but not until 2010. So uh, a little bit cynically, uh, imagine that, that after 50 years of a pretty tough so-called revolution, um, you're going to be allowed to buy a toaster. That strikes me as um, that, you know, the kind of reforms that we should be very careful about celebrating. Because I don't, I don't think Cubans would see that as a great leap forward but these are the reforms. And you, know, you hear a lot of members of the press internationally saying, boy, that Raul, is a, he's quite a guy. He's quite a reformer. People can now rent cars. They don't have any money to rent cars. They don't forget about that. But they, if they wanted to rent a car, they could rent a car. They could stay at a hotel for tourists. Hotel room costs $400 a day. But those are the reforms. Um, the, the human rights situation, I think, is something that needs to be talked about when it comes to Cuba. You may disagree on the embargo. You may disagree on our policy. And you know what? That's what's great about our country. We have disagreements. We can talk about it. But I hope there's no disagreement about fundamental human rights. Uh, there are people today in Cuba that are living on, in very cruel conditions. I mean, about as cruel as it comes uh, for having expressed a point of view that's different to the governments. Uh, they have a crime in Cuba called pre-criminal activity. So you haven't committed the crime yet, but we know you're about to commit a crime. They have another crime called dangerousness, and that can put you in jail for 20 years, 20 years. And one of the uh, very unfortunate tactics that they use in Cuba is they will throw you in a dungeon, they will deny you medical attention uh, after you get invariably sick. I mean, after two weeks, most people get sick in those conditions, and then you are denied medical attention. This is, this is some pretty cruel stuff. This is the kind of stuff that we didn't uh, that you may not be aware still happens in the world and happens 90 miles uh, from our shores. 
Uh, Dr. Oscar Elias Bisset is, is one example, um, and, and this is all out there. I hope, uh, I hope you look and, and, and find on the web and just find information. He's a, a medical doctor. He exposed uh, the use of forced abortions in Cuba, which got him into a heck of a lot of trouble. Um, five years ago, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Uh, he has been in prison for all of for all but 36 days since 1999 in unbelievably, uh, incredibly difficult conditions. He is an Afro-Cuban, and he has come to represent kind of the, you know, the, uh, the spirit of defiance that, that is taking hold throughout Cuba. Uh, and there are a lot of Cubans like that. Uh, Gorky Aguila. Maybe some of you may have heard of Gorky Aguila. He's a rock star, a rock musician in Cuba. Um, and he plays lyrics that are critical of communism and the regime and, and, and critical of, of what happens in Cuba. He was just charged recently with dangerousness. And there was a very strong uproar around the world about Gorky. Um, and so they let him free. They fined him $28 and let him go. And he's constantly getting put in jail. He, he has a concert. His, they don't like his lyrics. He gets put back in jail. Here's something he said after he, uh, after he was let out. He said, you know, um, I have just been let out of a small prison, and now I can go to a large prison. But it's all one big, you know, it's all one prison experience. Gorky Aguila. Finally, just one more person I'd like to point out. Uh, Ioani Sanchez in her early 30s, uh, an incredible, an incredible woman. She was named by uh, Time Magazine, one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2008. This is a Cuban blogger. She didn't know anybody knew her. Um, and she just blogs about life in Cuba. She's not, she doesn't get into, uh, deep into politics. She just talks about life under communism. She wrote, a dissertation called Dictatorship in Latin American Literature that was thought to be a veiled criticism of, of Castro. And, uh, and ever since then, she has been watched. She goes to hotels. She borrows internets. Uh, she borrows uh, uh, computers. She goes on the internet. She goes under uh, disguise. She goes under a different name. It's an amazing story. Uh, she recently won the Ortega and Gasset Journalism Award. She wasn't allowed to travel. Um, but she is someone to watch, and she's sort of the new, uh, a new generation of Cubans um, that is using new tools, new ways of communicating, and she's letting her voice known and be known. And because she is known internationally, because of what Time Magazine did, it's very difficult for the government to put her in jail or, you know, just have her disappear. So, someone to watch, uh, Yuani Sanchez. Um, okay, let, let, let me just, uh, in terms of the future, change. Change has to come from Cuba. Uh, we are not going to create change in Cuba. Uh, we are not going to take over Cuba. We, the U.S. government, there, that has... Uh, in, in 1962, after the missile crisis, the agreement between President Kennedy and, and Khrushchev was, you get those missiles out of there and we will not touch Cuba militarily. And we have abided to that. So there, there's no future where we see the U.S. running Cuba. Change has to happen in Cuba. And I'll tell you, the future leader of Cuba is not in Miami, not in New Jersey, but probably sitting in a jail cell in Cuba, uh, somewhere in Cuba. That's where the future uh, leadership is. So I, I get the question asked often, when are you gonna lift the embargo? Uh, when are you going to change policy? I don't think that's the right question. That the question isn't, when is Washington going to change policy? The question is, when is Cuba going to change policy? Because this is about Cuba, this is about Cubans, and this is about Cubans being in charge of their destiny. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to let them know that we stand for human rights. We're going to let the world know. We're going to let them know what's going on. But change has to happen in Cuba. Uh, the U.S. 
Ironically, you'll never hear this, but the U.S. is Cuba's number one, number one supplier of food. Number one. Number one supplier of medicine and number two supplier of cash. So in spite of the fact that everything that happens in Cuba, including the hurricanes, were somehow related back to the embargo, um, we are the number one supplier of food, medicine, and number two supplier of cash. Uh, and I, I find that uh, very, uh, very telling. So again, this isn't about US policy. This isn't about when is Washington gonna change? This is about when is Cuba gonna change a system that doesn't work. Um, and I think we all learned throughout the world in the 20th century that you know, Marxism, Leninism isn't, isn't a functional system. Um, that has to be learned uh, in Cuba. Uh, we believe, and, and I, I believe this personally, that there's a tremendous amount of talent in Cuba. There's a tremendous amount of vitality. There's a tremendous amount of creativity. And as soon as that creativity and vitality is unleashed, Cuba could be one of the uh, great societies, democracies, economies in the world. It's gonna take a long time to get there, but the potential is there. Um, what they need is, is freedom. So, uh, here's, uh, here's something for you is, again, we may not agree on tactics. We may not agree on the embargo. Um, I know some of you believe that Cuba has a great health care system. I want to hear your points of view. But what I think we can agree on is human rights. And I would hope that you take an interest in Cuba. This is 90 miles away from our country. There are family members who live here. This is a country with which we have had a close relationship for well over 150 years. These are neighbors. Uh, you know, this is uh, Cuba and the U.S. are very, very tied historically. Uh, I don't believe the Cuban people hate us, and I know we don't hate the Cuban people, uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, it's been drilled into their head for 50 years that all of their woes, all of it, is due to the embargo, not due to communism, due to the embargo, due to the U.S., due to the Yankees, due to the CIA, due, you name it. Um, in spite of that, I, I believe that the average Cuban respects and admires the U.S. the same way that we respect and admire Cuba. So, um, get, get involved. Get involved, take an interest, uh, take an interest in human rights. This is, this is right down the street. This is not just in our neighborhood, it's on our same block. And uh, again, Cuba will become a foreign policy theme during your generation. So I'd like to think that your interest in this conference today is, means that you're a bit ahead of your time. So thank you, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna turn over to you and thank you for your interest, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we now have time for questions. There are four microphones located, one here, one here, one here, and right here. Please line up. We'll just go in, in uh, clockwise order here. Now, there's only uh, one set of rules here, which is that uh, questions uh, here at the Kennedy School have three characteristics. One, the person introduces themselves. Second, a question is short, meaning there's like just one thought associated with it, and there's just one question. And third, it ends with a question mark. Um, and so with that, let me start right here. My name is Alex Loomis. I'm a freshman at Harvard College. And um, S Secretary Gutierrez, you've offered a very impressive moral condemnation of Cuba, and I think you did really do a good job accomplishing that. But my question to you is, relating to this whole question of the embargo again, you consistently said that it's, that's not the question today. But my question is, what does the United States accomplish with the embargo right now in terms of helping the Cuban people or helping to serve our national interest? Good. It's um, a great question. The, the, what the embargo has accomplished is it has denied a sworn enemy of our country more resources 
that he can use against us. I know that sounds dramatic, but let me go back a little bit in history. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested in Cuba, there's a great book. I, I believe the author's last name is Dobbs. It's called Five Minutes to Midnight. And it's a new, um, a, a new narrative of the 1962 missile crisis based on new declassified material. At that time, Castro had nuclear weapons pointed at the U.S., and it's now been pretty much confirmed that he wanted to use them. He wanted to use them. Think about that. 90 miles away, he wanted to just let it rip. Let's go for it. Whatever happens, let's, let's go for it. So the policy towards someone like that, you hope that at some point that there would be a regime change based on Cubans' desire uh, and, and ability, but our policy's been, let's, let's try to help the Cuban people, but let's not give this individual resources that he could use to hurt us. Anytime he has had resources, and we can go back in history now because we have 50 years, uh, he has used those resources to have a bigger military, more tanks, more soldiers, more planes. Uh, he sent his military to Angola. He has funded um, Marxist regimes in Latin America. Uh, but we have never seen, when he has had more resources, we have never seen that translate into prosperity for the Cuban people. Um, it's always been standing in line for rations. It's always been scarcity. It's always been uh, uh, oppression. It's always been a very, very tough, um, a, a very tough hand. So that is number one, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but let me just say this: any time in our history, we've had you know ten presidents now, starting with President Kennedy. Any time we've tried to get closer to Cuba, and I would say that President Carter was maybe the, the, the president who got the closest to actually uh, improving relations in a meaningful way, and he was, President Carter was insisting on the release of political prisoners. You know, we'll improve relations, but release political prisoners. Castro said, fine, you want me to release prisoners? He opened up his jails, and that was what led to the Mariel boat lift. We had 125,000 uh, refugees, and some of what, part of what we got was some of his worst criminals. So it was almost like telling President Carter, you want to be friends with me? I'm gonna make you regret it. That's one example. But, but the big thing is resources. If you have somebody who's your enemy who would like to see the world without you, help the Cuban people, sell them grains, sell them medicines, Allow cash to go in, but don't enable that person to point another nuclear weapon at you and shoot at this time. Thank you. Right up here? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, my name is Mara Rodriguez. I'm an alumni and also the daughter of a Cuban refugee. And your stories are very true, and most of my family is still in Cuba, so they're very real. My question is, as you know, we use the case study method very often here. And it seems like history has given us two case studies. One, Cuba, where an economic embargo has allowed Castro's regime to blame their ills on the US embargo. And the cultural limitations, the limitations and the restrictions on the cultural exchange has pretty much left the Cuban people in the dark and very isolated. And it seems we have a different case study, which is China, which uh, has enjoyed favor trading status has enjoyed incredible economic growth and incredible cultural exchange, the Olympics, a recent example. So my question is, how can we have those two case studies and call our foreign policy value-based? Sure. I always wonder what our policy would be if Cuba had one million Cubans, one billion Cubans. Um, and how have we not learned from the Chinese example, and particularly in the exchange of people, and particularly the recent travel ban of people coming back and forth, which can foster so much openness in the people. Why continue to limit that and not learn from our Chinese experience yeah, and success? Good, good, very good question. I would say that there is a marked difference between China and Cuba. Um, there's no question that there are improvements that China can still make 
and needs to make, and they still have plenty of room to move. But it's, it's hard to compare Cuba and China. And, and I will say that the, the big difference is that the, the Chinese leadership wanted change. Um, perhaps not Mao, but, but Deng Xiaoping wanted change. I mean, you know, in China, you can work wherever you want. You can live wherever you want. You can travel. Um, you can open up a business if you want. I, I find it interesting that it's still called the Communist Party of China. Um, it's communist in name, but boy, they've really moved away from collectivism and the Cultural Revolution and what have you. So I find that there is a tremendous difference between, uh, between the model in China and what they decided to do in the 70s uh, versus Cuba, where, as you know, after the special period when the Soviets pulled out, they, they decided to license some small businesses. As soon as things got a little bit better, they made business illegal. So, you know, the desire for change needs to happen in Cuba as well. I'll give you one more example before turning over to the question. The President Clinton was about to veto what is today known as Helms-Burton. This was 1996. And it was well known that he didn't like the policy. This was the, you know, the clamping down, the embargo, and really uh, you know, making it even stricter. And two days before that, they shot down a civilian plane in international waters. Is that, you know, is that welcoming a US president that seems to want to get closer to them? So it's been a very uh, difficult, complicated relationship, and we have seen nothing that would suggest that, that they're willing to respond to goodwill, they're willing to respond to some kind of overtures from the US. Sorry, going back to the second question, just thank you. Sorry, just the one question, travel, first. Go ahead quickly, but please, one person, one question. Yeah, uh, the, the travel restrictions today is uh, once every three years you can travel to Cuba. There, there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, support for li just letting, lifting the travel ban because of the hurricanes to let people go in. There, there are two things about that. When, you, when people travel to Cuba, as you know, they pay a steep price. So this is a, a, a source of income. You pay a visa tax, you pay an airport tax, you pay a taxi tax, you pay, I mean, you are, you, you pay to be there, which becomes a tremendous source of revenue. So, you know, we're trying to find this balance of once every three years. Uh, lifting the, the family travel at a time when the hurricanes have really hit would be a little bit akin to saying, a week after Katrina, our response is, let family members go to New Orleans. Let family members go to Galveston. I mean, we want to help them solve the problem, but we also don't want to give them a lot of breathing room at a time when we believe change will happen. And, and we believe change will happen for one very simple reason, uh, that Fidel is more and more out of the picture, and, and Raul is going to have a tough time keeping it together. Thank you. Right up here. Yes. Mr. Secretary, my name is Alex Palmer. I'm a freshman at the college. And I was wondering, given that the embargo has been used by Castro to blame the problems of Cuba on the US, do you believe it's had a positive impact in promoting the view among the Cuban people that the US is a friend and an ally? Yeah, it's good. another good question. I would say two, two things. One is, history never gives you credit for what doesn't happen. Or rarely does it give you credit for what doesn't happen. Um, I don't know what would have happened over the last 50 years if we had uh, Castro with more resources. Castro using trade with the US and companies who are investing in Cuba for his own personal benefit. We'll never know uh, because that never happened. I believe that Cubans are concluding that after 50 years of everything that happens being blamed on the embargo, I believe they know better. Uh, they just can't say it. But from what we hear, from what we understand, Cubans have seen through that argument that 
Anything that happens, it's the embargo. If something goes wrong, it's the embargo. If a building collapses, it's not communism or the fact that we never gave any maintenance. It must be the CIA. It must be the US. I think Cubans, um, there's been enough time that Cubans are actually seeing through that argument. And it's being, it's backfiring because it's so obvious. Thank you. Right here. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Yes, My name is Michael Fernandez. I'm a Yale College graduate and presently a student at the Fletcher School. I'm Kieran American and wanted to thank you for your very thoughtful speech and for all the fine work that you do in promoting the cause of a free Cuba. Um, my question involves um, the fact that earlier this year, Cuba was once again listed on the state sponsor of terror list, along with uh, you know, a whole host of countries. And it's cultivating ties with Iran, Venezuela, Russia, a whole host of countries that are opposed to US interests. I'd like you to comment on that and sort of give us what your perspective and what you think on of this situation. Yeah, good. Uh, I'll give you a couple of, uh, of, of examples. The, probably the most uh, significant example that's very topical is, is Colombia. Colombia. Uh, and we're going to be hearing about this a lot more over the next several months because of the three hostages that were just released, the three uh, U.S. citizens that were just released about the FARC. Um, and, and the FARC and the ELN and, and that M19 and all that movement of, of Marxist guerrillas in Colombia. But essentially, this is a group that, uh, again, very cruel. Um, You'll hear some amazing stories of what they do to people when they kidnap them. They are basically running drugs in Colombia because the, the drug business has fallen into the hands of these, these Marxist guerrillas. That's one example of, of Castro being associated directly with a terrorist group. Now, the reason I say terrorist group is the European Union has classified them as terrorists, and so have we. So that's an example of harboring terrorists or being uh, or funding terrorists or being close to terrorists where I mean, they've had a relationship that goes back to the 1960s. That's one example. There are others, but, but that's the one that I think is very, very much in the news, very topical, and one that we'll be hearing more about because I think these three uh, hostages that were released are going to start writing books and we're going to learn some unbelievable things about Colombia and that movement. Thank you. Right over here. Thank you. My name is Leonel Perez. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I was born in Cuba. I came here in 1998 uh, with my mother. Uh, currently, my father and the rest of my family still live there. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. And I would like to corroborate uh, your details as of for life in Cuba. Uh, I've been back to Cuba twice, last time and last year, so I can tell and I can, you know, that your descriptions of rations and terror were actually very accurate. Um, my question, it's related to some of what she said. Um, given that my family is in Cuba, uh, and then previous to 2003, uh, family members could travel every year uh, to, to Cuba. Um, and I was wondering, uh, what was the mindset, even though you, you came into the White House uh, a little bit after that change was made? Um, what is the, the idea of the values behind and where is the balance between trying to achieve change, and then uh, uh, affecting the, 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 the amount of times uh, I, uh, a person like myself can visit my father, um, and how the costs and benefits, you know, costs and benefits of, you know, in terms of political, in terms of personal, and uh, I guess uh, humanitarian reasons. Yep. Again, I think this is all about balance, and, and the policy is trying to achieve a balance. Not everyone agrees with that. Uh, but here, here's the irony is, is uh, and this is where I think they've done a very good job in Cuba of putting, constantly putting uh, the onus on the U.S. Why doesn't Cuba allow travel to the U.S.? You know, we're arguing about every three years and, and they love the fact that we're arguing about it and maybe it should be every year, maybe it's every five years and the fact that they take, you know, a commission and it becomes a revenue source but we never seem to debate why aren't Cubans allowed to travel to the US? So look, the, I think the answer is we're trying to seek that balance once every three years uh, is 
probably not enough for people who want to go more often because they have family members, and I understand that. Uh, but we're trying to strike the balance between making that a revenue source that, that, that gives the elite uh, an opportunity to stay in power. Again, not the Cuban people, the elite, uh, and, and just trying to strike that, that very fine balance. And to some extent, we are asking uh, Cubans with family in Cuba to sacrifice a bit. And I think we're all sacrificing. We're all sacrificing for the day that Cuba will change because, as you know, uh, the sacrifice has been made by millions of people. I mean, the, the stories are just, you know, the, 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 the boy who left without his parents, the parents who left without the boy, uh, the daughter the daughter who is today involved in prostitution because she wants to get medicine for her mother. I mean, it goes on and on. The family members in Miami who had to leave without their family, who they had to leave behind. Uh, the people whose son was 13, so he had to be in the military and they couldn't leave. With, I mean, just, it goes on and on and on. All sacrifices, I suppose that we're saying, let's all sacrifice a little because we need to, we need to do everything we can uh, to not make it easy for them to stay in power while helping the Cuban people uh, and not, not playing into their hands. So it, it's a balance, and, and I just, we try to strike it as, as much as we can. Again, going back to the food and medicine and cash, we think that's also a balance, even though some people would say, well, you're the number one supplier. So I, I appreciate your, your question. If I were you and I had family members down there, I wouldn't be satisfied with it three years. But I think that's, that's the nature of policy, as you know, that not everyone will agree. So, thank you. Right up here. Good evening, Mr. Secretary. My name is David Callow. I'm from the Kennedy School. Thank you again for your thoughtful comments. Um, given our human rights record and our support of nations like South Africa, Saudi Arabia, I find our policies towards Cuba antiquated, if not a bit hypocritical. You've encouraged us to get involved and yet you've said that this is a Cuban problem. What would you tell the people in this audience? How would you tell them to get involved in making a change? And what are the next steps, the tangible steps that as U.S. citizens and as a U.S. government we can take? Because we're in Boston, we're not in Havana. What actions can we take to make change in sure, Cuba? Sure, good, good. You know, the, um, I'll tell you, as, as a U.S. citizen, every society, I suppose, uh, can make progress toward perfection. Um, but I, I sleep very comfortably at night knowing that, that the human rights abuses in Cuba are in a very different league to anything we've ever seen in this country. Uh, the, the two things that are needed in Cuba, I would say, are one is information about the outside world. Because a lot of Cubans may not know that, that life doesn't have to be the way it is, that the U.S. isn't a place where, where we are cruel to everyone, where there is terrible racial discrimination, which, by the way, in Cuba, the racial discrimination is, is uh, something that we can take back decades. Um, so they need information. They need to know that, that life can be different because they've been hearing for 50 years that it has to be this way. It's either the Cuba model or it's Haiti. And they don't realize that there are some things that are in between or some things that are better. The second thing is helping them communicate with each other. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting but ironic that someone who is in Havana can't communicate with someone in Santiago. Uh, but we can communicate with them better than they can communicate with each other. So we've tried to help them. Help them, uh, you know, if you could uh, give them computers, if you could give them information about what's going on, if you can tell the world what's going on in Cuba. On May the 21st, we had something we called International Day of Solidarity with Cuba. And we had over 30 countries and NGOs in 30 countries who did something to call attention to pol political prisoners in Cuba. So people who were pro-embargo, anti-embargo, but I think we're all against political prisoners anywhere in the world. 
um, we just called attention to them. Now, whether that made a dent or not, I think those activities go a long way because it's, it's, it's a little bit like in the Soviet Union, just letting people know what is really happening there. Um, uh, the, the books that came out, the, uh, the archipelago, archipelago gulag, I mean, that opened the world's eyes about, my goodness, is that really happening in Cuba? The refuseniks, the, the, the Jewish community in the Soviet Union that, that let the world know the, the discrimination that was happening in the Soviet Union against Jews, I think that opened the world's eyes. Uh, that was in the 1970s. It took a while to, to, to have an impact, but all those things, all those things make a difference. And again, the model in, in the Cuba, the future of Cuba is in the hands of Cubans. What we're saying is let people out of dungeons. Don't, don't treat people like animals because they happen to disagree with the system or they happen to disagree with your point of view. Thank you. Afraid we have time for just two more questions up here and then down here. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Beato. I'm a student at the business school and also the daughter of two Cuban immigrants. Um, my question is, you know, now we've seen in the past, um, every time Cuba's come into some financial difficulties, we see other governments coming in and helping them, most recently Venezuela. And I think it's getting harder and harder to look at Cuban policy in isolation and, and seeing Cuba as, as not, you know, interconnected with all these other um, forces that are aligned. And I'm thinking, what policy are, is being looked at or what is being thought as far as general overarching policies as to these you know, anti-democracy states that, that have sort of aligned themselves together? That's a very good question. The, um, I, I thought you were gonna get to the, the hurricane aspect, but uh, it, it's a very good and very complicated uh, s uh, set of circumstances that is going on in the world today because you have countries that it's not that they have gone to another ideological path. It's not like, you know, they're communists and, and we are free market capitalists and therefore we have this irreconcilable difference. We have states that have uh, oligarchic systems, state controlled systems, but they believe in free enterprise, which makes it very difficult to address because we, they are our customers, we buy oil from Venezuela, so uh, they have tremendous sovereign wealth funds that they would like to invest in our country and uh, the money is uh, useful, uh, as you can imagine. So I don't think there is a simple answer. And if I told you, I said, look, this is the idea, this is what we have to do, I think I would be uh, over, over simplifying a very complex set of questions. The one policy that I know this president has stood firm on is if you see abuse, call it out. Um, I don't think Prime Minister Putin has appreciated uh, that President Bush has supported Georgia, that President Bush has called out when we have seen some difficult circumstances in Russia. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're our enemy, they're not, uh, but it does mean that we have a certain responsibility, just call it out, to just be that one country in the world that can be candid. We're doing business with you, but you know what? We think you should have more religious freedom. And that is the one policy that, as people talk about realism in foreign policy, people talk about needing to be more practical, uh, that is the one policy that has been part of our nature. Uh, and I would say it goes back to President Truman, but maybe even all the way back to President Wilson, that we have always stood firm with our belief that everyone should be free, that everyone deserves a shot at freedom. Even if you're our friend, if you're our neighbor, we'll point it out. Last question. Good afternoon, Secretary Gutierrez. My name is Cristina Spuru, and I'm a graduate student at the School of Education here. Thank you very much for coming. I echo a lot of your sentiments about Cuba as well. My father emigrated here following Fidel's revolution um, from Havana. My question to you is this. Following the transfer of presidential duties to Raul Castro in July of 2006, the United States made several 
um, a series of requests for political change in Cuba. And in December of that following year, um, Raul had said that Cuba was, quote, willing to resolve at the negotiating table the longstanding dispute between the US and Cuba, and uh, the United States declined talks. And I was wondering if you might be able to provide some rationale behind that decision, because to me, it would seem that communication would be an important first step towards ameliorating those relationships. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another very good question. The, if you read that speech, he did say that, and then it, the rest of the speech goes on to say, but we will not accept any conditions, and we will not accept that they, you know, nothing that is conditioned to what we need to do in order to be at the bargaining table. So uh, the fact that we have said liberate political prisoners, that's unacceptable, so therefore um, they don't come to the table. Uh, I, I also just would say this, that while Fidel Castro is alive, no one moves, and no one will move. They'll say a lot of things in public, and speeches are speeches, but uh, I don't believe that he will allow anyone to change their fundamental policy, which is, we are the anti-American. After Fidel, who knows? We'll have to see. We'll have to wait to see if, there, if it's a real uh, gesture of goodwill. Uh, but it is, it's very difficult to see anything changing, anything while he is still alive, and if he's still alive, he's calling the shots. The interesting thing will be, can Raul keep it together? Does he have the political skills, the, uh, the, the skills required to keep that country together with people so in need of things um, and, and really kept together with such a hard line? And that's something to watch, because I, I don't believe that it is, it is a simple answer. I, I, I don't believe that Raul will be able to keep it uh, as tight as Fidel. And you know, we'll be watching for signs of openings and signs where people are just saying, we've had it. And, um, and actually people taking to, you know, going to the government and demanding change. We'll see, thank you. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Secretary. Thank you all for being here. Tomorrow night, we have the President of Chile, uh, Michelle Bachelet, coming to speak. Please join us then. Thanks again. <laughs>